Today, in your weekly dose of space news, we're going to talk about a bus-sized satellite making an uncontrolled re-entry back to Earth, the most luminous quasar we've ever detected that might just be the brightest object in the universe, NASA hiring Martians, and more. Welcome to your weekly space news from Ad Astra. I'm Swapna Krishna. Let's start with scientists who identified a distant quasar that might just be the brightest object in the universe. Quasars are a kind of active galactic nucleus. An active galactic nucleus is a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy and the luminous accretion disk made up of gas and dust that surrounds it. Sometimes jets of matter can escape the accretion disk and we can detect these all along the electromagnetic spectrum. While all active galactic nuclei are bright, quasars are some of the most luminous objects in the universe. They're that bright because of the interaction between the gas and dust in the accretion disk as matter falls into the black hole. This means that quasars emit more light than our entire galaxy combined. This specific quasar, called J0529-4351, is about 12 billion light years away from us. And scientists examined it using the VLT, or Very Large Telescope. The supermassive black hole powering it is absolutely ravenous because that's how it works. The faster a black hole consumes matter, the more luminous the quasar. This supermassive black hole is eating the mass equivalent of one of our suns per day, which means it's the fastest growing black hole that we've ever detected. It's currently about 17 billion solar masses and growing. The accretion disk for the supermassive black hole is seven light years in diameter. Scientists have posited that it might be the largest accretion disk in the universe. This quasar was actually originally included in one of Gaia's data sets. Gaia is a very cool spacecraft from the European Space Agency that's creating a three-dimensional map of our sky. That's really the best way to find quasars, looking through these giant data sets from large swaths of the sky. But because there is so much data to sort through, scientists often use machine learning to identify potential quasars. But this particular one was actually initially ruled out by the computer because it is just so bright. It classified this quasar as a star much closer to Earth than it actually is. Scientists observed it last year, and only then did they discover that it was in fact a quasar. In the paper, which will be published in Nature Astronomy, the science team points out that there are probably many more quasars hiding in plain sight just like this one. In other cool cosmic news, Hubble has been doing an awesome series of photos on colliding galaxies. I'm really intrigued by this latest set, a galaxy that seems to be losing a cosmic game of tug of war. This is the galaxy AM1054325, which used to be a spiral galaxy like our own, but it's been distorted into this S shape with this galaxy tail because of the gravitational influence of another galaxy. What's interesting about this is that each of these little pearls is actually brand new star formation. This occurs when dense gas and dust is jostled by the gravitational pull of the other galaxy. It collapses and forms these star clusters with about a million new stars per pearl in this string of pearls. These clusters are pretty young in the cosmic sense, just 10 million years old. It's not clear what will happen to these stars. Will they stay part of this galaxy? Or will they become globular clusters that orbit their host galaxies? We have globular clusters like that here orbiting the Milky Way. Galaxy mergers and collisions don't actually destroy stars or planets. There's too much empty space for that. Instead, the interaction of gas and dust usually spurs star and planet formation. If you want to see more on this, by the way, I have a video of one or two of Hubble's other pictures in this series. I would be remiss here if I didn't mention the huge news of the week. I am one or intuitive machines attempt to land on the moon today, February 22nd. Unfortunately, the moon landing will happen after I film this, but I'll have an update soon on how the landing went. At the time of filming, the spacecraft is healthy and in orbit of the moon, so let's hope it all goes well. In other news, let's talk about space junk and a mission to remove it from orbit. Rocket Lab is pretty well known for its Electron rocket, which is almost entirely 3D printed. The company launches small payloads up to 661 pounds to low Earth orbit. On Monday, February 19th, Rocket Lab launched an orbital debris inspection satellite. That's right, it's a satellite to inspect space junk. 
Space junk is becoming a huge problem in orbit. There's somewhere in the neighborhood of 50,000 objects up there just floating around. Around 7,000 of them are active satellites, the rest are pieces of rockets, defunct satellites, and more. It's getting crowded up there. And I've discussed quite a bit how satellite pollution is affecting both ground and space-based astronomy. Satellite trails are now even affecting Hubble images. Not only that, but there's something called Kessler syndrome, which is kind of a scary scenario that one small piece of space junk might collide with another and another and another and create this chain reaction that might destroy all the active satellites in a particular low Earth orbit. We clearly don't want that happening, which means that figuring out a way to clean things up up there is pretty important. If you're wondering why these objects don't just fall back to Earth and burn up, well, they often do. This actually happens once a week or even more. I'm actually going to talk about ERS-2, the bus-sized defunct satellite that came crashing back to Earth in a few minutes. But even the ISS needs regular boosts from visiting spacecraft to stay in orbit. Otherwise, its orbit would decay and it would fall back to Earth. But the ISS is in a very low orbit comparatively. In higher orbits, where satellites are traveling relatively fast, the orbital decay is pretty negligible. We can't really just wait for these satellites to come down, and the kind of uncontrolled reentry this would cause can be very dangerous. This is where this satellite, which is from the company Astroscale Japan, comes in. It's a partnership with JAXA, the Japanese space agency, much like NASA partnered with the company Intuitive Machines on their lunar lander. The larger aim here is to figure out a way for robotic satellites to approach and retrieve large pieces of space junk from orbit. This satellite, called ADRAS-J, is the first step. It's designed to test technology to approach and rendezvous with large pieces of space junk. We have a lot of experience with rendezvous in orbit. The ISS does it all the time. But that's with two spacecraft that are designed for this specific purpose. Orbital space junk is not, which is why this is just the first step. This mission will only fly around the second stage of a Japanese H-2A rocket that launched in 2009. It'll take pictures and study debris for three to six months. Astroscale reported that today, February 22nd, the Adras J satellite successfully began rendezvous operations as it moves to the orbit of the H-2A rocket stage. It is a big challenge. They don't know the condition of the stage. It can't be communicated with. It doesn't transmit GPS data, so we don't exactly know where it is, and there's no way to control the rocket stage. It's hard. But I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens here, and I'll continue with updates as I have them, because I think the space junk thing is a huge problem, and this mission might be really important. Speaking of space junk, you may have seen headlines about ERS-2, the bus-sized satellite that came careening back to Earth this week. The 5,000-pound satellite was launched by the European Space Agency in 1995. At the time, it was a sophisticated Earth observation satellite. But after its mission ended, it became just another piece of space junk. The ESA has been slowly deorbiting the satellite since 2011. After 66 maneuvers to gently guide the spacecraft back into Earth's atmosphere, the defunct satellite finally hit 80 kilometers above the Earth's surface. That's where the pull of the Earth is strong enough that a piece of space junk will start breaking apart. The actual reentry was uncontrolled. They use a nicer term, natural reentry, but I don't like this because it's nicer, and space junk and uncontrolled reentry are not nice things. The European Space Agency used up all of the remaining propellant on the spacecraft to get it to a point where it would break apart in the atmosphere. Once it started on its fiery journey back to Earth, there was nothing to do but watch it burn as it re-entered over the Pacific Ocean. The satellite imaging company, HEO, actually caught pictures of the satellite on its way down, and it looks awfully familiar, like something from a galaxy far, far away. If you're looking for a new job, NASA put out an interesting ad this week. They're looking for Martians. The job is for a year-long simulation of a Mars mission starting in the spring of 2025. It's the second of three missions that's part of CHPEA, or the Crew Health and Performance Exploration Analog. You would be a part of a four-person crew living and working inside a 1,700-square-foot space called Mars Dune Alpha, located at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. You'd basically be simulating all aspects of a Mars mission. 
According to NASA, that includes, and I quote, resource limitations, equipment failures, communication delays, and other environmental stressors. The first mission is underway right now. The crew has grown crops, made simulated spacewalk. The 1,700 square feet includes an outdoor area that simulates Mars's environment and other performed activities to help NASA understand what astronauts might go through when living and working on another planet far from the help and resources of Earth. It's certainly an interesting job if you're interested and in between the ages of 30 and 55 and are a U.S. citizen or permanent resident and are an English speaker, you can apply at NASA's website. In rocket news, there's a few interesting things going on here. First, Japan successfully launched its H3 rocket for the first time this past Saturday. This is their new flagship rocket, and this was actually the second launch attempt, but the first was unsuccessful. That was almost a year ago, and the rocket lifted off the ground, but the second stage failed to ignite. It's great news for Japan, which has been trying to become more and more of a presence in spaceflight over the past few years. The question is whether this rocket will be able to compete with SpaceX's Falcon 9, as well as other rockets like ULA's Vulcan and the upcoming Ariane 6 from the ESA. Blue Origin also had interesting rocket news this week. The new Glenn rocket is vertical on the launch pad. This is Blue Origin's new heavy lift rocket, as compared to their new Shepard, which is a suborbital rocket that they use for tourist flights and science payloads. The new Glenn rocket was rolled out to Launch Complex 36 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. There's no launch on the schedule, this is just for testing. A test called the Integrated Tanking Test, specifically in which they'll fill the first stage with propellant. In this case, they're going to use liquid nitrogen for the test, but the rocket will use liquid oxygen and natural gas, similar to the second stage of the Saturn V rocket that took astronauts to the moon during the Apollo program. The rocket doesn't currently have engines installed. They'll be installed after the test. A hot fire test, which is when they'll finally fire the engines, could happen this summer and then the vehicle might finally be ready for launch. And I believe that is all the space news I have for you this week. I will have an update on the IM-1 landing coming soon and other videos in between. But if you're just coming here for weekly space news, then I will see you next week.